I'm Etel Solingen. Uh, I'm the Thomas and Elizabeth Tierney uh, Chair in Global Peace and Conflict Studies, formerly Chancellor's Professor. I joined the Department of Political Science in 1989 and I'm affiliated with the Center for uh, Global Peace and Conflict Studies, the Institute for Global and Regional Studies, and the Ethics Center at UCI. So in the early 90s, I became intrigued with some, um, why some regions are more conflictive than others. And I developed a theoretical framework to explain what drives conflict and cooperation across regions. The conventional wisdom uh, had been to explain regional orders through so-called balance of power and security, uh, narrow security considerations, but that approach seemed to me limited. I thought we needed to weave together uh, into a single framework the mutual interactions between Inter political economy and security on the one hand, and international and domestic factors on the other. But how do you bring all of that complexity together? Well, I thought um, we might begin by looking at the implications of globalization for domestic politics. So globalization triggers concerns related to economic considerations, identity, values, norms, and nationalism. So politicians organize those concerns and craft competing coalitions on the basis uh, of uh, those different constituencies to advance their own political survival. I think two models capture the essence of this uh, uh, framework. Internationalizing models thrive with increased engagement in the global economy. Inward looking models with decreased engagement with the global economy. Internationalizing strategies privilege economic growth, access to markets, uh, global markets, international uh, capital, um, investment technology. Uh, they thrive with regional cooperation uh, and uh, stability and with domestic macroeconomic stability. And all those objectives are synergistic, meaning they're mutually reinforcing uh, at, at all the levels, domestic, regional, and global. So internationalizers try to avoid wars that compromise uh, those objectives. Conversely, inward-looking uh, strategies benefit from uh, external insecurity. Nationalist status, pro uh, protectionist interests, uh, military-industrial complexes, all those uh, actually exploit external tensions because insecurity and economic closure help ex uh, these constituencies capture resources from society. Uh, they enable car cartels, uh, monopoly rents, they reward protectionism, and they undermine internationalizing competitors in, in the domestic realm. So by their very nature, inward-looking uh, models boost the probability of war, even if they may not necessarily always be inten intend that. So uh, in sum, we're internationally Internationalizing models dominate a region. They converge on uh, mutual incentives to avoid wars. In contrast, where inward-looking uh, models uh, dominate in a region, their incentives to exploit tensions for domestic purposes also converge. The detailed links between these modular theoretical components uh, uh, of the theory were later elaborated elaborated later uh, in, the in a 1998 book entitled Regional Orders at Centuries Dawn. But the basic insight survived, I think, the test of time. Many contemporary challenges in international relations can be understood through this prism of the competition between the two models, from rising nationalism in Europe to radical uh, movements uh, in, in the Middle East, Putin's imperial onslaught uh, on Eastern Europe, domestic battles in, in, in China's, uh, for China's future, and so on and so forth. The general argument can be applied uh, worldwide and to many issues, but over time I looked at specific topics such as, well, first, in the 1990s, I came upon a puzzle that I think may be even more significant today. The Middle East and East Asia shared common initial conditions around 1950. Harsh uh, autocracies, ethnic conflict, 
uh, high income inequality, state building challenges, and mil militarized conflict. And yet, if you fast forward to the present, the two regions look dramatically different. Despite lingering tensions, East Asia has avoided uh, militarized conflict for several decades now uh, in sharp contrast to the Middle East. So what explains this diverging trajectories out of initial common conditions? The models I described uh, earlier are, I believe, an important part of the answer. Internationalizing models played a crucial role in avoiding wars in East Asia thus far, and inward-looking models in promoting wars in the Middle East. Uh, when I began this research in, in the 1990s, balance of power arguments uh, predicted that East Asia would be the next cauldron of war. And it wasn't as clear back then as it is today that East Asia would become a nerve center of the 21st century global economy. So it was rather risky at the time to impute too much weight to internationalizing models as drivers of regional cooperation. But I think the empirical record thus far supports the hypothesis that these models have consequential implications. Now, is war out of the question in East Asia? Not necessarily, but it is more likely with domestic inward-looking shifts in that region, and I explored the conditions that may lead to such shifts. A second application of the general argument was explaining why some states pursue nuclear weapons and others do not. In a 1995 article um, in International Security, I identified thick connections, deep connections between political economy and nuclear choices, or political economy models of the kind I, that I described earlier and nuclear choices, and the, th the connections were uh, strong conceptually and empirically. A fuller application of that argument appeared subsequently in a book entitled Nuclear Logics, which entailed years of research on the nuclear choices of Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, North Korea, Israel, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Libya, and many others. Now, uh, I found that typical balance of power uh, arguments suffered from serious empirical anomalies and conceptual problems. Uh, such arguments should have actually done a lot better in explaining nu nuclear choices because this is, in so many words, their matier, uh, their forte. Uh, but instead, the findings provided significant support for the hypothesis that nuclear um, or that models of political survival actually explain those nuclear choices rather well. And the prior omission of this hypothesis from the theoretical repertoire in the discipline had led to an overestimation of other causal drivers, including balance of power uh, theory. I believe the, the models in question can explain better why nuclear uh, policies vary over time, even in the same country. Uh, why different states vary in their uh, compliance with international uh, commitments uh, in the area of non-proliferation. They explain why security dilemmas are more intractable in some cases than others. Why some states rank alliance higher than uh, um, uh, self-reliance or vice versa. Uh, why nuclear weapons surfaced where one might have not expected them or security hardly justified them, but actually they were avoided when one might have, in, in places where one might have expected them. Okay, other findings. Uh, first, uh, nuclear logics examined the demand side of uh, nuclear proliferation, why some states uh, wanted, uh, wanted them and why. Uh, which states wanted them and why, I should say. I later organized a collaborative project on the supply side, the supply of international inducements. So, for instance, do sanctions or positive rewards make a difference for uh, nuclear choices? The $64,000 question, of, of course, regarding North Korea, Iran, even Iraq, Libya, and so many other cases. So. 
Despite ample disagreement over the effect of sanctions in the profession, one thing is clear. Models of political survival are a crucial part of that answer. States are not monolithic entities. Uh, international actions have different domestic distributional effects. Uh, a second uh, recent project uh, addressed ongoing assertions that China's rise today is very similar to that of pre-World War I Germany, and that just as balance of power and so-called hegemonic transitions presumably led to war in 1914, 100 years ago, that we face similar conditions today. Well, not so fast. Uh, first, not everybody agrees that balance of power, or whatever that means, uh, led to World War I. Uh, there is ample dissent on the sources or the causes of World War I. Second, there are crucial differences between the dominant models in China today and that of Germany in 1914, and in the strength of internationalizing forces in each one of them. Uh, third, the global political economy then and now are dramatically different. It was quintessentially protectionist in 1914. And today it is underpinned by, uh, far more strongly I would argue, by foreign direct investment, supply chains, um, uh, network technology, international institutions, and proliferating trade and investment agreements. The point here is that a historical analogies, analogies that ignore the overall context of the world time, uh, are misleading and they're also dangerous uh, because they peddle the in inevitability of war. Be the choice between uh, presumed atavistic tendencies toward war, invariable, invariable over time, between that and accommodation on the other uh, on the other hand, that choice exists and models of political survival, I believe, are crucial to that choice. A third project addressed the relationship between political economy and uh, political economy models of the kind that, that I described earlier and democracy. Now, the two are distinct categories. So I examined different paths and sequences in the evolution of uh, these two categories across regions including, uh, for instance, the relationship between internationalization, uh, Islamist movements, and democracy. Another application uh, tackled international and regional diffusion, the theme of my address as president of interna the International Studies Association. Uh, that project explored how models diffuse within and across regions uh, through learning, socialization, emulation, and other causal mechanisms, and how models actually act or can act as firewalls, firewalls preventing diffusion of trade, migration, capital, and ideas such as uh, nationalism. Now, so these patterns of intra and extra regional diffusion, I think, remain an important research frontier. So back to my main point uh, or my main theme, there is a lot more work to improve our understanding of distributional effects of globalization across states, regions, and across time. The recent global crisis uh, brought this agenda back to the fore, uh, or really with a vengeance. Uh, it, uh, it was more difficult to imagine such crisis as the one that we've witnessed uh, recently, writing in the, the mid-1990s, the golden age of globalization. And yet, Regional Orders, the 1998 book, devoted an entire chapter to the vulnerabilities of internationalizing agendas or models. And we, not, we may not yet be completely done with the potential effects of the Great Recession, not just for jobs and economic growth, but also for international security. It is really hard to measure how much difference uh, academic work makes, but one can look at some signs. So first, at the level of fundamental 
understanding of what drives global peace and conflict, I think there is greater recognition today that balance of power theories were overstated and that older approaches to nuclear proliferation were at best incomplete, if, if not misleading. For example, Nuclear Logics uh, won the highest award um, in political science, the APSA's uh, Woodrow Wilson Award and the Jervis Schroeder Award. Uh, course readings um, today offer students a more balanced menu on the sources of conflict and cooperation, nuclear proliferation, etc. Second, at a different level, uh, this mode of analysis spilled over beyond academia into the uh, policy and expert community and even the public sphere. So that all conventional wisdoms are now challenged in the media, law reviews, and published government research. This does not mean consensus. Uh, it just means a richer debate on these topics. Third, uh, third level that I can think of is track two meetings. These are meetings sponsored by universities, research uh, institutions, foundations, or even government agencies. And those track to incor have incorporated uh, these ideas. They, they, they gather academics and officials in, in an unofficial capacity, uh, and they put them together to try to, see, to overcome obstacles to cooperation. I've been fortunate to attend a number of these meetings, many around the world, and I think the conversation has certainly evolved over the years. There will always be people that see North Korea, uh, North Korea's uh, behavior simply as a function of uh, deterrence, uh, as if there is nothing else uh, to it. But um, I think that more sophisticated understandings linking nuclear behavior to an inward-looking political economy are now more common. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to, to say that it's extremely gratifying to see UCI students carry on these ideas, not only to other academic institutions, but also to the real world of government agencies, the United Nations, research foundations, and, and NGOs.